Of course, there was still the small matter that Abe Burroughs had never written a Broadway show before, but he was an experienced radio and television writer with a great gift for character and comedy, and he now had the best in the business at his side, in the shape of George S. Kaufman, who told him just to take a deep breath and set up your story. Just talking musicals, musicals, with you. Hello, I'm Leslie Ann Knight and welcome to Just Talking Musicals and part two of our Guys and Dolls story. In 1948, up-and-coming Broadway producers Cy Foyer and Ernest Martin had already struck lucky with their first Broadway show, Where's Charlie? For they knew if they were going to make their names as successful Broadway producers, they had to have a follow-up and it had to be good. One day, Martin called up his partner from California and pronounced, I am holding in my hand one of the greatest titles for a musical you've ever heard, called Guys and Dolls. The title Ernest Martin had just fallen for was an anthology of stories by newspaper man and writer Damon Runyon. Runyon's style of writing was very distinctive, almost always in the present tense, a mixture of formal speech and colourful slang, with passing references to the good book thrown in for good measure, to illustrate the odds, like, The race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but that's how the smart money bets. With their creative juices flowing and the blessing of the Runyon estate behind them, Cy Foyer and Ernest Martin set to work. The first and most obvious step was to enlist Frank Lesser, who had pretty much written four songs before he even had a contract in his hand, and his enthusiasm was still keenly etched in Cy Foyer's memory some 50 years later when he was writing his autobiography. With his unchecked enthusiasm, Frank went ahead and wrote a song. He wrote it without knowing a thing about the show, the story, anything. He too was inspired by the title. It was a terrific piece of music written as a roundelay for three guys in a mildly contrapuntal form. Frank called it a fugue for tin horns, but it would later come to be titled Can Do. There is a kind of kinetic jolt you get when something works like that, when three guys click, all come to the same conclusions and see the same possibilities. The accumulated energy is greater than the sum of one guy's exuberance. We were on fire. But finding the right kind of writer for this show wasn't plain sailing. In fact, it took six or seven writers because in all honesty, they just hadn't realized what they really wanted. And what the script really needed wasn't to become another love story to match up with the likes of Rogers and Hammerstein's latest smash hit that had recently opened at the Majestic. So with a brief to write a script about a beautiful missionary worker who falls for a no good gambler who eventually makes good, they chose Oscar-winning screenwriter Joe Swirling to write the book for the show, acclaimed designer Joe Milsner for the set, and Tony Award-winning Michael Kidd for the choreography. Joe Swirling set to work on the first act, writing the book for the show. They had decided to base their musical comedy on one Runyon tale in particular, the idyll of Miss Sarah Brown, and then draw characters and scenes from other stories, including one aptly named Blood Pressure, to add spice to the plot. But when Swirling came back with his first draft, he was met with much disappointment. He was a skilled writer, but in the time it had taken Swirling to write the first act, Foyer and Martin's idea of the script had moved on. The brief had completely changed. Runyon's world wasn't particularly one where romance was the focus. What they decided they needed now was someone with a feel for Runyon's world, and rather than a serious romance, it needed more comedy. And Foyer, Martin and Lesser each knew someone from way back who would be just perfect for the job. Abe Burroughs was a native New Yorker with a highly successful writing career in radio and television. He had made his name with the phenomenally popular radio show Duffy's Tavern. And by the time they approached him to join as writer on the show, Mr Burroughs was happily up to his eyes working on about three regular television shows for the CBS network and yet they still somehow succeeded in luring him away from that very lucrative pay packet to come and write their show, which must have felt a little like financially skating on very thin ice. But Burroughs knew each one of the protagonists from way back, and you could argue he didn't have a chance, or in his words, they didn't ask me in a casual way, they walked in and ganged up on me. These two fellows have always been very difficult to say no to. Sai was a fellow student at New Utrecht High School and Ernie was the man who had pushed me into being a performer. And then there was Frank Lesser, one of my oldest and dearest friends. 
In addition, Ernie and Cy told me that as choreographer, they had hired Michael Kidd, who had done the wonderful dances to Finian's Rainbow. Even more important, Mike had also gone to the new Utrecht High School. It all seemed to be destiny, too perfect to turn down. And somewhere deep down, Burroughs must have known he was right for the job, confiding in his autobiography some 30 years later that he'd even met Damon Runyon years before when Runyon, a fellow table guest at the cup room with newscaster Walter Winchell, was upbeat even in the face of his daily battle with throat cancer, and he passed Burroughs a note telling him how much he admired his work on the radio show Duffy's Tavern and that he liked the way Burroughs' New York mugs talked. But when I told him I thought his New York mugs were the greatest, he answered me with another note saying something like, Abe, my New York dialogue is a fake because I was born and raised in Dade County, Florida. He died before I started on Guys and Dolls, but what he said stayed with me when I took on the job of putting his people on the stage. I felt I probably would have had his approval. With Burroughs signed up, Foyer and Martin then scored a hit with their choice of director. It probably wasn't possible to find a greater director for this show than double Pulitzer Prize winning writer George S. Kaufman. According to Abe Burroughs, he'd been fairly reluctant to take on the job at first, but Kaufman's trusted friend and producer Max Gordon had heard Frank Lesser's songs and cabled Kaufman, urging him to take up the offer. Hailed for his sharp wit and intuitive sense for the stage, George S. Kaufman was one of the most famous and successful American playwrights of the 20th century, and Foyer and Martin hit the jackpot when they signed him up to direct their musical fable of Broadway. Of course, there was still the small matter that Abe Burroughs had never written a Broadway show before, but he was an experienced radio and television writer with a great gift for character and comedy, and he now had the best in the business at his side, in the shape of George S. Kaufman who told him just to take a deep breath and set up your story. And so, guided by Kaufman's advice and the 14 songs Frank Lesser had already completed, Abe Burroughs set about creating a story full of wit and charm. Guys and Dolls tells the story of the gamblers, hoods, showgirls and mission workers going about their everyday business on Broadway in spite of the perils of prohibition, painting the picture in the nostalgic glow provided by the ever-present neon light shining down on the Great White Way. Nathan Detroit splits his time between finding a venue for the latest crap game and keeping his doll, Miss Adelaide, a dancer at the local hotbox club and fiancé of 14 years, not only happy but well away from his exploits. High rolling slick Sky Masterson takes on a bet to take one of the prim mission worker dolls, Miss Sarah, on a date to Havana and lives up to his word that he never welshes on a marker. And with that, you have a story that rumbles along in a slicker fashion as Sky Masterson would ever have rolled his dice. Right, that's it for this episode. Coming up, how Frank Lesser's impatience led to an apocryphal apology to his leading lady and how George Kaufman's legendary meticulousness drove the cast relentlessly on till they finally arrived on Broadway, exhausted but ready for opening night. I'm Leslie Ann Knight. You can find Just Talking Musicals on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and as a handy podcast as well. Oh yes, and as ever, we'd love it if you press subscribe. There's nothing to pay, but it means you get sent a message when we post a new episode. And coming up, don't miss part three of the Guys and Dolls story here on Just Talking Musicals. Just Talking Musicals, musicals with you.